so today we're going to talk about um, a thoughtful approach to dyspnea based on a case-based conference. Um, the learning objectives for today are to define dyspnea, um, develop and refine a differential for the patient, patients who present with dyspnea, and then identify appropriate testing strategy for those patients. So, um, just as a heads up throughout the talk, when you see, or um, yeah, never mind. So first we're gonna define dyspnea. Um, and the American Thoracic Society defines dyspnea as a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that consists of qualitatively distinct sensations that vary in intensity. The experience derives from interactions among multiple physiological, psychological, social, and environmental factors and may induce secondary psychological and behavioral responses. Um, that's a mouthful. And what I want to highlight here is how complex this very simple, seemingly simple complaint is. Um, it took the ATS two sentences and several commas to define it. So I don't expect anyone to master it after a one hour talk. Um, but I do want you to have maybe a more uh, consistent approach. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here is that it's important to recognize um, when the difference between shortness of breath or dyspnea and extra work of breathing. You can have both at the same time, um, but I certainly want you to approach extra work of breathing with an extra urgency and recognize that it is objective, whereas dyspnea is a subjective complaint. So um, I want to highlight here that through the course of this talk, I'm going to pull up this background screen and it's your cue to participate. Um, so I will break folks up into breakout rooms at variable times or just ask you to unmute yourself or participate in the chat um, during when this comes up. For right now, I'm gonna ask you guys to go into a breakout room and I wanna talk about the differential for dyspnea. Um, so, I'm going to get put you guys into three breakout rooms. I'm just going to give you about four minutes to come up with this differential. I want it to be as broad as you can. Um, so go ahead. Okay. Cool. You guys are in a breakout room. Um, or I, we don't, I think like we don't have to join the breakout room since we have. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I'm just going to Oops, someone, can someone move the mouse over there so you guys can see this again? 
Okay, cool. Okay. Um, just, I think, welcome back, everyone. Um, so, we're, I'm sure you had a broad differential. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and shout out some of the things on their differential or add it to the chat? If not, I can always ask the folks in this room. We've been working on dyspnea this week to join in. Um, oh, great. We've got some broad categories for dyspnea period. Okay. Um, Cassandra, do, oh, perfect. Lungs, heart, blood, acid, base. Awesome. I love that. So it sounds like Cassandra has kind of a systemic approach already. Um, any specific diagnosis? Oh, no worries. External compression of airways. Awesome. Um, I love the that thought from UCH and, and Jason John. Um, I think, again, thinking we, we in internal medicine tend to think about ooey gooey center. That's how I describe what I do to my friends and family. I work on the ooey gooey center. Um, and we sometimes do miss those external causes of um, airway disease. Um, Denver Health during the week has been getting a lot of lectures on um, dyspnea. And so we have a pretty extensive um, differential on our board right now. Um, I'll just pull out a couple things to highlight. Um, we've got pneumonia and URIs, various forms of sepsis. Um, volume overload, arrhythmias, trauma, pneumothorax, COPD, plus minus an exacerbation, asthma, aspiration, anaphylaxis, um, effusions, cancer, anemia, paralysis, um, ACS or MIs, and PE. Um, so just things to keep in our mind um, moving forward. So, um, the initial evaluation, um, according to um, societal guidelines, um, the AMA, the American Thoracic Society, as well as the all-knowing up-to-date, um, really is based on three key things for dyspnea, that being the history, physical exam, and chest x-ray. Um, I think this is important um, and pretty a reasonable approach to almost every admitting complaint, but I want to highlight here that you should have a reasonable differential and be able to limit your invasive testing based on these three things, um, which is, all, I think, always a goal of providing high quality care. Um, once you get to that end of the history, physical exam, and chest x-ray, um, again, all the societies agree that you should have a leading diagnosis or at very least a leading um, cause of diagnosis. And oftentimes they frame those causes in three broad categories, um, being a low cardiac output state, a high cardiac output state, or a respiratory gas, respiratory gas exchange problem. Um, low cardiac output, they suggest evaluating with an echo, EKG. High cardiac output, um, they would recommend just CBC, TSH. And respiratory gas exchange problem would just be ABG, PFTs, and CT. Um, again, I think the thing I want to highlight here is that for this incredibly common complaint, we should be able to get to a most often be able to get to a definitive diagnosis without extensive invasive testing or even very much blood work at all. Um, and hopefully the cases that we work through today kind of highlight that objective. Um, so the first case I want, I'd like to have folks work through is a 23 year old gentleman who called for this morning for a same day clinic appointment. Um, so what I'd like you to do is again, I'm gonna give you another two minutes in the breakout rooms. Um, and I'd like you to tell me what are the top three things on your differential for this gentleman. Um, okay. So what do you guys, when you hear, you know, first thing that comes in asthma, asthma. Yeah. great. I'm just going to write it because that's how I organize my thoughts. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. Asthma infection. 23-year-old male who has a head doctor, so asthma is pretty high. Yeah. Okay, I like it. <laughs> this is true. some other underlying Okay. Um, Long history, we'll just say. Okay, um, and then what else? Maybe he has 
Okay. I like it. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Enjoy it. It's great. Okay. So that was 38 seconds. This takes a really long time. Awesome. Okay. So, um, if any of, if any of the groups want to, again, join the chat or just unmute themselves and share what you guys came up with, I'd love to see it. Um, you may have heard some of the stuff that we had, um, leading theories seem to be maybe asthma because he's a young guy who has a PCP, um, sometimes smoking related injury or maybe an infection. Any of you guys come up with different thoughts? Okay. Um, well, oh, perfect. Elicits in general, i.e. meth. Awesome. I think like a healthy dose of suspicion um, and concern for that, recognizing common behaviors that might be more, more common based on demographics. Um, perfect. So. He's in the office now. You go into the room to see him. And again, chief complaint is still shortness of breath. So he says that the shortness of breath began yesterday after he fell while he was skiing. Um, didn't improve with Tylenol, naproxen, or oxycodone. He had a couple fives left over from a knee surgery last winter. Um, it did, the pain kept him awake last night, um, and he doesn't have a history of asthma, chronic medical conditions, daily medications, or no, and no allergies to medications. Um, and in the chat or shouting out, any other questions about his history that you want to know before we jump to vitals and exam? Perfect. So has the shortness of breath changed, gotten worse or better over the time? He says maybe worse. It's definitely no better. He seems to be noticing it more now. Where's he from? Um, he's from California originally, but has lived in Denver for a long time. Um, talk more about how did he already fell? Did he hit stuff with ski pole, et cetera? So he was just, he was going down a bump run. Um, his skis went out from under him and he kind of fell on his side into the mountain. He didn't hit his throat or anything like that? Uh, he didn't, not that he recalls, um, he feels like the left side of his chest is pretty sore. That's where he landed. He kind of landed downhill, um, like flipped over his skis, um, but was able to get up, ski down, kept skiing afterwards. It's just kind of on the drive home and the rest of the day, he feels worse. Uh, oh, bruising seatbelt sign, alternative ski sign. Not that he's noticed. Um, yeah. That's a really difficult question. Um, Elizabeth was asking in our room, um, is it pain or something else limiting and causing the shortness of breath? And I think that's a huge key and really important to differentiate, especially in a patient like this, where you've got a couple possible etiologies of his shortness of breath. Um, and he says, you know, I feel like even when I take a deep breath, I don't breathe in, I can't breathe normally. I feel like it's less than normal, but I definitely am not breathing as deeply because of pain too. Um, okay, so for vital signs, unexciting. Um, I tried to highlight anything exciting in red for you guys, um, just so we can kind of go through it. He is setting 90% on room air, which arguably is on the low side for a healthy active 23 year old in Denver. Um, his exam is, again, not too significant. Um, he's well-developed, well-nourished gentleman who does appear somewhat uncomfortable. He's got moist mucous membranes, a clear oropharynx, um, trachea is midline, no lymphadenopathy, 
got a rapid rate, um, regular rhythm, uh, normal pulses. He's got good air movement in all the fields, but definitely a decreased inspiratory effort. No crackles or wheeze. Um, and his chest has diffuse tenderness to palpation at the left axilla, no point tenderness. Um, let's see. And then, and skin exam, you don't notice any bruising. Um, yeah. Any other exam questions? So now um, I'm going to ask, what's the first test that you want to order? Test x-ray. Perfect. Yeah. This is a trick question. I already told you this answer. It's the, the next, the only other part of the evaluation that we haven't looked at so far. Um, so I'm going to have one, uh, well, actually, we'll, I'll give you guys a minute to look at this chest x-ray, and then I'd like to have someone um, read it for me. If anyone in this room volunteers, you get bonus points. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I have a volunteer in my room to read it. Go ahead. Um, it looks like the airway is midline. Um, it looks like the, the diaphragm is kind of where it should normally be. Mm -hmm. Good costophrenic angles bilaterally. Yeah, and they are sharp. User error that they're not perfectly visible. I'm trying to, I'm trying to see like, uh, like hilar, maybe like uh, some patchiness of the hilar areas bilaterally. Yeah. Not like super diffuse. Um, I don't think I see any fractures in the ribs. Awesome. Yeah. Great. And then the heart doesn't look too big. Great job. Um, yeah. So just to make sure everyone could hear, um, some light, we saw a mid, midline airway, maybe a little um, increased prominence of the mediastinal structures. Um, I would agree with it. It's kind. It's, it's always hard to tell in like young, healthy males. Their structures are just a little more prominent oftentimes because they're young and healthy. Um, the heart size seems appropriate. Diaphragms are visible. Um, and no clear fractures of clavicle or ribs. Um, I would definitely agree. Any other additions, thoughts, anything else people are looking for on this? Yeah, excellent. So thinking about atelectasis, and it does look like even though he's maybe not breathing great all the time, there's no bivascular um, uh, collapse. So um, this is a really tricky x-ray, which is why I chose it there's actually a very small apical left-sided pneumothorax. Um, and so, and this is, I've had, I, this patient, I've had other patients like this. It's not an uncommon presentation for young, healthy gentlemen. And as Tevi pointed out from the beginning, is he like kind of a tall, more tall and slender? You can tell by his chest x-ray, he probably is, um, with trauma leading to spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, it's a tricky diagnosis in this one, especially um, it, because a lot of the line of the lung overlaps with the rib shadow. Um, but again, this is a very a great example of a case that literally the only test you needed to order to make this diagnosis with a chest x-ray. Um, you chose the right test and you, ha you have the answer. Um, the key is really making sure you have a sy systematic approach, um, looking for lung markings, in all the lung fields all the way out. And again, it's somewhat subtle. They're not incredibly clear lung markings on the right side, admittedly, um, but they're absent on the left side. Um, I, so I think just again, highlighting, always look really careful for pneumothoraces. Um, that's, it's probably one of the more often misdiagnoses that's on chest x-rays. Um, even I've had a misdiagnosis on a chest x-ray after a central line insertion when we were looking for a pneumothorax. Um, so healthy degree, degree of suspicion there, but great work. Um, so, and again, we're not going to focus on management because we're just talking about making sure we get to the diagnosis, worry about managing it on, in other talks. Um, so next case, we have a 58 year old woman who's presenting to the ED with shortness of breath. So again, 
I'm going to have you guys break out. Um, and before you, before you do, or as you go, I want you to say, before you know anything else, going through that broad differential, what do you, what do you think is most common knowing nothing else about her other than you, uh, you look at your list, she's 58 and came in with shortness of breath. Just gonna give like two minutes. Am I? Okay, I like it. Okay, let's see. The breakout rooms are closed. Oh, two seconds. Okay. Okay. Um, so welcome back, everyone. I think I um, just want to highlight, uh, I highlighted our room how different the differential looks, just knowing only the age and sex of this patient. Um, whereas before we were talking about pretty acute onset things, these are all more chronic things or the products of chronic disease, what we came up with this time, um, including things like an MI, um, COPD, heart failure. We also talked about more acute things like PE, anxiety, sepsis, pneumonia. Any big things that you folks had that were missing? Okay, taking deafening silence is a no. Um, so for her, um, when we go see her, she said that she says that she's periodically felt short of breath for the past month. But now the shortness of breath is constant and has been increasing for the past several days. Um, she doesn't have any significant medical history, doesn't take any medications every day, um, and isn't supposed to take any medications every day, to clarify, those are different. Um, but she has been now finding it difficult to lay flat. That's why she came in. Um, last night, she couldn't get comfortable and just really didn't sleep well at all. Um, she also notes some swelling in her legs um, and feels like her heart is racing. So any other questions before we go back to those vital signs? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. She just feels like it's going way, it's going faster than it should. Um, and her vital signs seem to agree with that, at least. Um, she's got, she's afebrile, but her heart rate's 115. She's got normal blood pressure and she is only 92% on three liters, doesn't usually wear any oxygen. Um, physical exam, again, she's uncomfortable appearing. Moist mucous membranes, but has a rapid irregular rate. Um, on exam with diffused bivascular crackles and two plus lower extremity edema to the mid shins. Um, any other exam questions folks have? JVP? Yeah, so you, you look and you think it's certainly elevated, probably your guess would be somewhere about the angle of the mandible, maybe a little bit below, but you do think there's some hepatic jugular reflux as well. Okay. And then you get this chest x-ray because you know that that's the next step. Um, anyone want to pop into the chat? Uh, let's see who we have here. Um, 
there's anyone able to maybe what someone from the VA team D pop into the chat with kind of a one sentence summary read of um, of this chest x ray. Also have one of the poor, the poor interns here at Denver Health with me are just getting getting thrown under the bus. Um, what about you, Samantha? Do you have a read, or just kind of a one sentence summary? Um, Excellent. Yeah, I think that's that's perfect. Yeah. So. Here at Denver Health, we said some bilateral fluffiness. Um, and I think if we wanted to be even more technical, you could say like bilateral interstitial infiltrates um, that don't like, if you had to guess if it was in the interstitium of the lung or intraalveolar, um, what would you guess more interstitial or any interalveolar? Um, yeah, excellent, interstitial which makes us think more of like a pulmonary edema process. Um, so, um, the big thing you can kind of, you can see if there are, um, see, so like air bronchograms and the, the cephalization of the vessels is one of the big things that you can see lung markings and lung vessels um, more than two thirds of the way out. They should typically stop around where I'm kind of tracing with my, mouse here, but the fact that those vessels continue out, um, it means that there's likely fluid around those vessels. Yeah. Okay. So now um, I'd like everyone to spend, again, just two minutes quickly and come up with the next test they want to order. Um, Again, you can order as many as you want, but we want to try and think about what's going to be the most high value test um, and get us the most information most quickly. Okay, so um, the big tests that we came up with here at Denver Health were we want to weigh her, we want to, want to get a B Nancy peptide, um, a TTE, and an EKG, um, which I think are all very reasonable. I don't know if we had other tests, people are welcome to throw those into the chat. Um, and so here she did get a considerable amount of blood work. Um, and I would like to highlight and posit that that B Nancy peptide was actually the only really helpful piece of um, lab evaluation that we got. Um, not to say, I, you know, I think it would be, it feels odd to only order like a BNP in this patient, but her vital signs were only significant for tachycardia. She's doing pretty well overall. We have a chest X-ray that gave us a pretty high degree of suspicion for pulmonary edema, 
Um, and so I do, I would argue that I think it's reasonable to potentially only order a pretty minimal blood workup, um, especially, I don't know that we needed the LFTs in this case. Um, um, and the BNP, again, even that was pretty potentially arguable. Um, CBC can be helpful looking for anemia. Um, but, and so then we also got this EKG. Um, and I'll give you guys a minute to look at that. Um, and then, and if anyone wants to pop into the chat their thoughts as we're looking at it. Flutter wave, says Sam King. And I could not agree more. Um, I chose this EKG because it's classic. Um, there are flutter waves with exactly, you stole the words out of my mouth, Sam, variable connection or variable conduction. Sorry, can't speak. Um, so this, um, again, just highlighting that with a chest X-ray, BNP, maybe CDC and EKG, you can have a pretty good idea of diagnosis. Um, if possible, I'd love um, for someone to throw into the chat a problem re problem representation for this patient, or anyone here with me can um, put one together. So we're talking, we need age, she's 58, um, any known contributing factors or comorbidities, chronicity of condition, and then kind of the clinical syndrome you'd identify. Awesome. Um, oh, perfect. And yeah, so Cassandra's just saying, in general, I don't love getting LFTs to work out volume overload since cirrhotics can have normal LFTs and a liver be cause for overload. Obviously not the issue presently, just a thought. And I completely agree, Cassandra. I think LFTs, there are many valuable places for it, but for volume overload, maybe shouldn't be on our order list. Um, would for, refer abdominal ultrasound to look for morphology. Excellent point. Um, again, I think if you're worried about a liver more, liver physiology, uh, imaging is going to be more helpful unless you're talking about al alcoholic liver disease, something we talked about last week. Um, perfect. So anyone want to hazard a problem representation for this lady? I can get you started. She's a 58-year-old female, no known significant past medical history, presenting with... I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm looking for Sorry. No one here, sorry. Um, look, what, presenting with subacute shortness of breath. Let's see, found to have the evidence of volume overload on chest x ray with an elevated BNP and AFib on EKG, concerning for probably some form of decompensated heart failure. Um, and because of that, um, I didn't highlight it, but she did have an elevated absolute D-dimer. It was within um, age-adjusted limits, but regardless, she got the CT. Um, I pulled out kind of a representative slice um, that just does demonstrate um, pulmonary edema as well as some bilateral effusions. Um, so that's a, a pretty, pretty typical of what you would expect. Um, this was a patient who um, turned out to have um, new onset AFib leading to um, decompensated heart failure um, with volume overload. She got an ablation and actually, I think her EF recovered over the following months and did really, really well. That's why I chose it. AFib is great. You can fix it. Um, okay, so we have one more case to go through. Um, this one is a 19-year-old brought in by EMS with shortness of breath. Um, I'm not going to have us break out this time to talk about the differential because I think we beat that horse to death. Um, but we'll talk about, you find out he was found unresponsive in a bus station. Um, he received 0.4 of Narcan with a good response. However, he's now on 10 liters. Um, he's, you talked to him and he says he's traveling by Greyhound from California to Minnesota to start school as a mechanic. Um, he says he'd been noting myalgias, arthralgias yesterday. Um, he's been on the bus for like three days at this point um, and does feel like he was coughing yesterday. Doesn't have any history of asthma. 
Um, medical history is significant or chronic back pain following an MVC three years ago, um, for which he typically takes naproxen. Um, he denies any smoking history or history of illicit drug use. Um, what, what other questions do you guys have? Okay. So his vital signs are pretty impressive, especially if you consider he's 19 and should be pretty able, well able to compensate. Um, he is afebrile, but he's tacky to the 120s. Blood pressure is elevated, 131 over 82. He's breathing 25 times a minute, and he's satting only 87% on eight liters. When you see him, he's on those 10 liters, and he's in the low 90s. Um, but that's from a gentleman who was fine on a bus an hour ago. Um, his physical exam, he's young. He's breathing visibly rapidly um, with about five to eight word dyspnea. Um, head, ear, nose, eyes, nose, and throat are unremarkable. He's got the rapid rate, but a regular rhythm. Um, his pulmonary exam is significant for diffuse ronchi um, and a cough that's occasionally productive of this like frothy pink sputum stuff. Um, no edema in his extremities. And then this is his chest x-ray when he came in. So from there, what tests do we want to order now? I think I might have this. Oh, yeah. So I'll give you guys, again, a minute, two minutes in the breakout rooms, come up with the next test that you want to order and a problem representation. Um, I'm going to ask if anyone can type it into the, uh, the chat and we can come up with one here too. Let me just mute myself. Cool. And then any other tests? Standard stuff. Okay. Um, so everyone's back. Uh, here's the chest x-ray again. Um, so the summary statement we came up with was a 19-year-old gentleman um, presenting with no known past medical history, presenting with acute hypoxic respiratory failure in the setting of a probable or suspected recent opioid overdose. So these are the tests that we get back. Um, I should have highlighted the VBG too. It's pretty abnormal. Um, I would say the, the biggest takeaway is that he's really not um, perfusing well, or yeah, not ventilating well, sorry, not speaking. Um, his BMP is unremarkable. His CBC has a little leukocytosis um, with some left shift, but his respiratory viral panel is negative, BNP is normal, lactate with three, CRP normal, and the utox is positive for cocaine and benzos. Does anyone have a way or how do we reconcile a utox that's only positive for cocaine and benzos with the fact that he appeared to respond to Narcan? Excellent, yeah, maybe the test isn't picking up what he took. 
Um, and that is absolutely the case. Um, fentanyl is not often, det or at least on this Utox, not often detected. Um, so I'll give you a little more history now, um, you because now you have this positive Utox after he said that he wasn't doing any drugs. Um, and you go and talk to him and say, you know, help me understand, like, do we need to retest your urine? Was this incorrect? Or is there, is it possible you took anything? And he goes, well, on the bus, I realized I didn't have ibuprofen or an aproxen. And someone had some blue tabs in an aproxen or in an Aleve bottle that he said I could buy from him. Um, so I bought those and took those and don't really remember much until I woke up in the bus station. Um, and I, I feel like meth doesn't last that long in the system as well. And people definitely have issues with hypoxia after smoking it from Cassandra. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a very good point that meth can also not be on a Utox. Um, and I, we had that thought as well. Um, and with this gentleman's story, um, as we were admitting him, we kind of went back and forth of like, how much are we going to, after you, you tell us no, and then you say, well, maybe this, it's really difficult to say if he had anything, if he took more intended to or not. He seemed certainly very shaken up by the experience. So I'd say he didn't mean to take whatever it was he did take. Um, and giving him the benefit of the doubt doesn't harm us in any way. Um, so we talked with him about the, um, you know, avoiding buying drugs from strangers. <laughs> um, and then, but we were still concerned because he has this pretty significant um, oxygen requirement and concerning x-ray findings. Mm -hmm. So we got a CT um, and the CT looks like this. Um, and also I remember he had that frothy pink sputum, which is not typical um, for, I would say like crack lung or meth lung. Um, that's more of kind of a dry cough. Um, any thoughts on the CT? Um, so I think um, would worry about diffuse alveolar hemorrhage if he's had bloody output, Cassandra, bivascular consolidative opacities. Excellent. Um, so these are some of the exact thoughts um, that the radi radiology had. They read it as widespread dense, greater than ground glass opacities, which I haven't seen before, um, but greater than ground glass opacities, consolidated throughout all lobes, likely a combination of edema, hemorrhage, possible concern for ARDS or superimposed aspiration. Um, and, and Sam King says, it would be weird for aspiration to be bivascular like that. And to completely agree. Um, so uh, we, in the good news was he got oxygen therapy overnight. Um, didn't get any steroids because he was never wheezy, um, but got aggressive oxygen therapy, supportive care, and he didn't require any additional doses of Narcan. Over the next 48 hours, his oxygen requirements gradually went down. His chest x-ray didn't change much, but remember chest x-ray findings typically lag um, clinical condition. And ultimately, um, this case was attributed to a negative pressure pulmonary edema. Um, so the thought here is that we do suspect he took fentanyl unintentionally and overdosed. And with that overdose, when he got the Narcan, he had the um, sudden impetus to breathe again and was breathing in against a closed airway, um, which can cause negative pressure pulmonary edema. It's the same mechanism that can cause negative pressure pulmonary edema for people with really severe OSA, um, is breathing in against an upper airway obstruction. Um, and he, it's, and it's pretty relatively well documented in the literature that this, this can happen. It's certainly not a reason not to give Narcan, but something to be aware of um, in the setting that you're giving Narcan. Um, and certainly not a common finding um, for an individual who is young and otherwise healthy, but something to think about when you don't have other good explanations. Um, and just to mention too, as, as he was in the hospital, he never looked infected in any way. He got blood cultures drawn and sputum cultures, but nothing ever grew from those. Um, we were able to discharge him back to Greyhound. And I assume he's flourishing in mechanic school right now. Um, well, excellent work, everyone. 
Uh, thank you so much for your participation. Oops, and we kind of talked about that. Um, and I hope you have a great weekend. Cool. Great job, guys. <laughs>